cases by now. But today we come to the final one, which is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This would have been more appropriate to preach next week. Am I coming through? I'm not. How much does that help? That should help. Okay. So, okay, we're back to the Spirit. Sword of the Spirit with the Word of God. I said it would be more appropriate next week because guess what next Sunday is? Anybody know? Bible Sunday. Okay. It is Thanksgiving Sunday as well. And I got a great Thanksgiving sermon. The Lord is called Thanks for Nothing. And that'll be next week's sermon. Come and see what I can do with that. So, anyway, this would have been a great sermon for next week, which is Bible Sunday. But today we're going to be talking about the Sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Which quite often when we hear that, we think, what is the Word of God? You might know what the Word of God is. You think it's a trick question? No. Okay, it's a trick question. You would assume that I'm talking about the Bible. There's no more problem with that. When Paul was writing his letter to the Ephesians, do you think that Paul in his mind when he said, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, he was thinking about the Bible. There was a problem with that, wasn't there? Because there was no Bible. He didn't have a Bible at that time. You say, well, he may have had the Old Testament Scriptures, but even the Old Testament Scriptures, as we know them today, had not been formed yet. They may have had what they call the Torah, which today, even in the Jewish faith, is the only real Scripture for the Torah. The rest are just added on. The Torah, the first five books, the Old Testament. But the Old Testament, as we know today, had not been formed yet, even at the time of the early church. And certainly, there was no New Testament. Paul was one of the first writers of the New Testament. The Gospels hadn't been written yet when Paul was writing. And in fact, when Paul was writing Ephesians, this is always a good question. Um, did Paul know that he was writing the Bible? And he was writing a letter to the Ephesians of the Corinthians or whoever he was writing to. Did he sit down as he wrote that and said, okay, now I'm going to be writing scripture here. I'm going to be writing the Bible. I don't think so. How did the Bible come into being? How did the New Testament, especially as we think of it, come into being? Well, that's hundreds of years later. Hundreds of years later before they finally, some church council came to conclude that these are the books that we should include in what became known as the Bible. And there was great controversy about which book should be or should be in there. And various church scholars had various ideas of which of what the list should be. But those, finally they came up with those books that we now consider the New Testament. But just because a few hundred years after, after the death of Christ, some council came up with, with what we now consider the Bible doesn't mean the controversy ended. Because there's been a change even since. Did you know that? Did you know that not all Christians have the same Bible? Sometimes during the Reformation, a whole section of the Bible was thrown out, at least in our Protestant Bibles. Now, those of you who are with us today who are of the Catholic faith, the Roman Catholic faith, you have a different Bible than we do, don't you? Did you know that? There's a whole section there. If you, if you have the, uh, the New English Bible, which you have the Bible. Of the English Bible, I think it's the Catholic. There's a whole section of the Apocrypha. We don't have it in our Protestant Bibles. Because Luther didn't think it was appropriate to have it in the Bible, so he threw it out. Well, we have a difference even there. And, and in addition, in later years, in the 20th century, many books were discovered in Egypt that went back almost to the beginnings of the church. One of them called the Gospel of Thomas, and you've heard of that. And there's been debate whether that should be brought into the Bible. So there's still a debate going on about what makes up the Holy Spirit. But we have with us today several examples of the Bible. These are, these are just ones that I took from my library this morning. Um, this is the one that I use most often because it's a translation I like. And some people ask the question, say, what is the best translation of the Bible? Well, the best translation of the Bible would be no translation. It would be to read it from the original language. And I'm sure many of you do that. You read it in Hebrew or you read it in New Testament Greek, right? If you don't, then you have to rely on a translation in English. And let me just tell you right now that every translation in the English is imperfect. They're all imperfect. 
Because you can't translate from one language to another and do it perfectly. It's impossible. So every translation is imperfect. I'll talk a little later about you know, what, what is the best translation. But this is a, a revised standard version. It's taped with the you can see here. Um, it's actually Mark. She got it on her birthday when she was 10 years old. And uh, I, I kept it because I used to have mine that I got when I was in third grade. It was almost the same, but it fell apart. So, I'm, I'm, and what do you do when a Bible falls apart? Well, I'll talk about that a little later, too. But, um, so, I, I kept Mark. I love it. It even smells good. They have that certain smell that takes you back to when you were a kid. I love it. So, so that's, that's one that I often use. It's a revised standard version. I've got a living Bible that my mother law gave me. And it's got my name pretty on the front, beautiful leather. Uh, this is a living, um, what do you call it? The, uh, the living Bible, which is a paraphrase, not a translation. It's a paraphrase. That's different uh, than a translation. And I've got it marked up here in the back. I've got some things uh, marked in the yellow magic marker. Uh, this is a good news Bible. I have no idea where it came from, but it says uh, May 29, 1978. So I've got, I had at least at that point in time. Um, this is a good news Bible. Many of you are familiar back in the 70s. It's became very popular. Uh, this Bible, I took, I went to the whole New Testament and took almost each section. I thought I had, yeah. And uh, I, did, I, I did have a lot of study with this one. I marked little things, little C's by commandments, and K's by key verses, and P's by promises, and all that kind of stuff. So this was something that I marked up pretty good at one time. Uh, this one's falling apart. I use it quite a bit. Did not get another new revised standard version. Not the revised standard, new. The Walters gave this to me. And uh, this one's getting pretty beat up. That's not going to make it much longer. This is my traveling Bible that I take to the Holy Land. Um, so it's like a stick in the pocket. But it's hard to read in dark places. So it's really, plus, it's a red letter. So you may have some red letter editions. The red letters are. Jesus is speaking. That's really hard to read in this dark, so I have trouble with that one. Here from Holy Land. Uh, this is one that lays up the Green Lake Chapel gave you for the church there. It is the new King James Version. Here's another one that my uh, dad gave me. It's an awesome chain reference Bible, the new international version. So all kinds of versions of the Bible. I've used these in different ways, different times, and marked them up and um, So which of these is the best translation? The Revised Standard Version. Why? Because it's what I want. I bet some of you, I think there's still some of you alive who think the King James Version is the only version. I bet they can tell you. And I bet their funerals, they said, well, at my funeral, you will not read from any other translation of the King James. Why was the King James so important? That's what they grew up with. So uh, whatever's helpful to you, as I mentioned, every translation is important. Um, pick the one that works best. That's that's the main thing. That's the main thing. So that's the best translation. Whatever works for you, revised standard for me. That's what I grew up with. Revised standard. Uh, but I, I enjoy using other ones too. So that's one one uh, puzzle that's been answered here. Um, another one was I, my concern is now what is the word of God. We oftentimes, when I Googled that this week, and I went in and said, okay, Word of God, sort of Spirit, Word of God, almost every reference to the Word of God dealt with the Bible. He said, this is the Word of God. Friends, this is not the Word of God. It's the written Word of God. But do you know who the Word of God is? I didn't say what the Word of God is, I said who the Word of God is. Look at John, Gospel of John, first chapter. The Word of God is not a thing, it's a person. The Word of God is Jesus Christ. That's right there, the first chapter of the Gospel of John, where John is talking about the Word, the Logos. And he mentions that, that, that the Logos, or the Word of God, became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, who would that be? Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God. So we talk about the Word of God, we talk about Jesus. This is a written word of God. It's important, but it's not the word of God. The word of God came to us in the flesh. This is the written word of God. It's important. It's important to, for us today to look at. 
But we need to realize that our worship is towards Jesus, not a book. In reality, this book is just a book, isn't it? In many ways, it's leather, it's, it's got pages, it's paper, it's got print on it, but it's a book. It's the way that God speaks to us out of this book that's important. It's not the book itself. We don't worship the book. Now, I, I've had people tell me in the past that when they grew up, for instance, there were rules about the Bible. One was, you never put anything on the Bible, right? You may grow up with that kind of rule in your house. You never put anything on a Bible. Another one was, what do you do? You never get rid of a Bible, either, do you? We were just discussing this because we got a lot of Bibles in the library, and I just told them, what do you know what you do with whole Bibles? Did we throw them away? Now, that sounds sacrilegious to us. I have to go down. What do you do with these Bibles? Let's ship them to Africa. We're all with the understanding of English. And secondly, what are we telling them when we send them our own way to our own Bibles? We should be sending them new Bibles. Which is why I try to give my money to communities and some organizations. And now good Bibles. And not just sending our used up Bibles. That's another story. But I, I'm just telling you that we need to be careful because sometimes I think we tend to worship the Bible, the book, instead of the true word of God. Not to say that the Bible isn't important. Need to remember who it is, what it is in worship. So, as I mentioned, I believe that the importance of this book is the fact that it is in this book that somehow, in some way, God speaks to us. And it's not the only way that God speaks to us. God speaks to us in prayer and any other way, I believe. But this is one of the ways that God speaks to us. As I read the Bible, sometimes I read the Bible, and I know you've done this. You're reading the Bible and it gets pretty dry so stop. If you ever try to read through the whole Bible, you know how horrible it is to get through those first few books of the Bible. Especially the laws and the genealogies and the description of the tabernacle that goes on for chapter after chapter. Some of it really doesn't seem to apply. But I, I'm sure that this has happened most of you as well. There are times when you're reading scripture when suddenly, in some way, it just speaks to you in a way that nothing else does. I can't explain it. Someone once asked, we were at, we were at Petra, but the high place of sacrifice, and there were several of us there, Peter Miano, the Society of Women's Studies. Not sarcastically, but just a, a real, a, 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 it was a deep question. He said, what's so special about the Bible? He said, it makes us think, what is special about the Bible? And my answer, I don't know. All I know is there's something that speaks to me. There are times when I'm reading this, and all of a sudden, my, as, as, as with John Wesley, in all this case, my heart is strangely warm. It's just like something grabs hold of me. Something grabs hold of me. There is something special about this book. And these words that speak to us in a very special way. And so in a very special way, it is a sword that we can use. And I want to conclude by just talking a little bit this morning about how do we use the scriptures. A sword can be used in two ways. It can be used defensively, and all the rest of the armor, by the way, is defensive, isn't it? I know the rest of the armor of God is actually going to strike out somebody else. The sword can be used defensively, like the rest of the armor, but it can also be used offensively. It's the only part that Paul talks about that can actually be used against another soldier in a combat way. So it can be used defensively. How can we use the Word of God defensively? There are times when we are under attack, as a soldier would be. There are times when in our spiritual walk, we come under attack. Some people want to say it's from Satan. Others simply talk about the attack of doubts, fears, <coughs> things that would seek to prevent us from being what God has called us to be. It's in times like that that the Word of God becomes a weapon. As I read the Word of God, John Wesley said that the time we need to pray the most is when we feel like praying the least. And I would suggest the same is true of the Scriptures. That the time we need to get into the Word of God, the Scripture, the written Word of God, the most, are those times when we feel most 
under attack. And we probably at least want to read it. But it said that we ought to open it up and begin to read. To see what God would say to us in those moments of despair or whatever it is that's confronting us. The Word of God becomes a defensive weapon when we are under attack. But at the same time, it becomes an offensive weapon. Because we are called by God to go into the world and to be God's kingdom. As we talked about in the previous sermon series, we're to be God's kingdom in the world. And to be God's kingdom, we need to know what that means. And to reading God's word, the written word of God, that we learn from Jesus and from others what it means to truly be soldiers or warriors. God, be citizens of this kingdom as we go into the world to represent Christ. So I want to encourage you today to think about the place of the written word of God in your life. How to use it. Yes, on a daily basis, and I confess that it's hard sometimes for me to do that. But we need to be in the Word of God. I'm thankful for this church because we have so many groups that are meeting every week to study God's Word and to learn more about that Word. And each of us individually, as we go forward, and as we talk about the armor of God, all the pieces are so important to us to remember that maybe the most important piece of all is God's Holy Word. The written word we call the Bible, which points us to God's word, which is Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for the armor that you have given to us. For the armor that includes truth and righteousness and peace, faith and salvation, and most importantly, the word of Jesus Christ. With Christ. We can conquer all things. There is nothing that can defeat us. Give us strength then, Lord. Whether it's through your holy scriptures, whether it's through other means that help us to draw near to Christ, and allow Christ to live in and through us as we seek to be 